So hi, welcome everyone who's on um, with us this evening. I'm Christine O'Donnell, the founder and director of Beacon Gallery here in Boston's South End. I started this gallery in 2017 and have worked with the purpose of both making art accessible, creating a community, and putting on shows with social justice as a central theme. It's a delight to welcome all of you virtually this evening to Resist and Repair, where we will be examining the intersection of art and politics. How can the emotional visual language of art counterbalance the current negative political discourse to inspire change? Before we begin, let me start by thanking the many people who have helped to make this event possible. The co-hosts have been an amazing group. This includes Representative Ruth Balzer, Carol Fulp, Kathy Gasparine, Jill Goldenberg, Anne Ellen Hornage and Ned Murphy, Representative Kay Kahn, Margaret McKenna, Karen and Kevin Tav, and Diana Weimar. We also have many patrons of the arts supporting us. Richard Dale, Betsy Paluto, Philip Pratt, Nick and Kay Shani, Joel Sklar and Adrian Shishko, and Lizbeth Tarlow, and a champion of the arts, Newton Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller. Thank you all very much for your support. We have three different sections in our program this evening. We'll be hearing from multiple voices in the arts community, including Makiba McCreary and Rob Pro Black Gibbs, as well as Karen Tabb and Diana Weimar. But before them, I'm happy to introduce Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healy, who will be sharing some of her thoughts. Hi, everybody. I just want to say uh, that I'm so happy to see you all tonight. I am delighted, Karen. Thank you so much, Kathy, um, Christine, all of the folks who have worked hard to put this together. It's a great event. It's coming in the middle of a great week. Um, already, we've seen wonderful artists perform at the convention with more to come. So that's terrific. And I really, really can't um, underscore uh, enough how I think, you know, for all of the heartache that we've been through with COVID and the disparities that we knew long existed, of course, revealed in such stark ways, uh, George Floyd's murder and the killing of so many innocent uh, black people, you know, what that has resulted in, I think, in this time is a time of real uh, potential transcendence. And, you know, today we mark the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of uh, the 19th Amendment and its ratification in the women's right to vote. And, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you all on this day, of course, and really pleased that we're on the precipice of honoring that by uh, electing uh, the first female vice president in our nation's history, my friend and former colleague, Kamala Harris. Um, and as I think about today, and I think about that anniversary, I think about the struggle, whether it's a struggle for uh, the women's, women's right to vote, the civil rights struggle. I think about the struggles of our immigrant communities, our LGBTQ plus communities. You know, you could go back and look through time. And by the way, of course, we know these struggles continue to this day. Um, but I think we also have to take a moment to take heart and draw inspiration and courage from those who've gone before us. And I think about the fact that I hope that we can draw inspiration from these people and, uh, and from this, this, this history and use it as the, the, the fuel to continue us in the 77 days that we have ahead of us. Well, is uh, 450 years of systemic racism. And as we look to build in new and different ways, because I never talk about rebuilding, I talk about building anew in different ways. I hope we do so uh, seizing the opportunity to build out systems that rid us of the disparities that we've seen. And I know with Joe Biden as president and Kamala Harris as our vice president, with a house and with the Senate returned to the Democratic Party and the ousting of Mitch McConnell uh, and his leadership, uh, which is not really a way to describe what he is about, I know that we are poised to do great things. 
Today, I also uh, was quite busy. I may, many of you may have seen that uh, we announced the filing of a lawsuit along with other state AGs around the country against the Trump administration and Postmaster General um, DeJoy. And we've all seen what's been reported in the news. Um, no doubt about it, Donald Trump is not just running for re-election, he's really running for his life. And he needs to steal this election, essentially, uh, in order to keep himself from prosecution and out of jail. So there is no uh, depth that he won't sink to, to, to try to do that. And certainly his efforts to both soak in mail-in voting such that they won't go to the poll, they won't uh, mail-in vote, um, is exactly, you know, uh, to his electoral advantage he views. And so he's trying to do that on the one hand, and then it looks like, you know, he's actually trying to uh, obstruct and hinder the operation of the post office, which is just horrifying. When you think about right now, today, people need that for Social Security, for their unemployment checks, uh, for their prescription drugs. Um, all, most of our veterans receive you know, most of their uh, prescription drugs through the be in court already um, following our announcement um, uh, yesterday, essentially. Uh, Joy came out with a with a statement and purports to, to reverse some of the positions he's taken. We're, of course, not going to believe that for one minute. We're going to press ahead and, and uh, make sure that there is accountability and make sure that the right things are in place now. And to the extent the wrong things have been done, uh, we're going to make that right. And so that's a little bit of an update from uh, where we are in, in uh, the state of things. But I just, again, want to tell you how heartened I am uh, by this moment. I think the Biden-Harris ticket is a ticket that is going to unify this country, that is going to move us forward. I think uh, it was remarkable to me to see how many people from so many walks of life respond so positively to that. And I also want to give it up to all the artists um, out there because so much of um, the important storytelling that is so necessary to the evolution of our society and the recorded history of our society happens through the arts. And no doubt we provide a measure of peace and enjoyment and, and joy, but you also are very much a part of recording history and recording moments. And um, though I lack um, any artistic ability whatsoever, I do so appreciate the role of the arts, um, a vestige of enlightenment, which this country used to be about until uh, the Trump administration, um, but something that is always there to, to give us hope and inspiration. So beyond tonight, um, I look forward to the conversation. And my last words, don't be afraid, get out, um, vote early, uh, vote by mail if you want, um, and just make sure that everyone you know and love all around this country is registered and will be casting a ballot. And as AG, my job is to make sure that those votes all count. Good evening, everyone. My name is McKeith, I'm McFerry. Um, and I have the pleasure of um, having a uh, conversation with Rob Gibbs, um, who I've also had the pleasure of um, partnering with and um, watching grow over probably decades of time. And so this is truly um, an honor uh, for both of us. I think we, we like to talk. <laughs> so yes, we do. This is easy. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I was actually, I wanted to start taking notes um, uh, when uh, the Attorney General was, was talking about art and how powerful it was. And I, um, I lost track because I was also listening very intently, but that was really incredible um, and really resonated for me. Karen asked um, the two of us to think about the power of art, how it connects to activism, um, the empowerment of neighborhoods and the mentorship of youth and art and all of those things, honestly, you embody. So um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, but I feel like you will um, go ahead and take us down another road if, if you feel so compelled. Um, mm -hmm. So for those of you who don't know, um, I first, I really wanted to take a minute to say congratulations to you, Rob. You have just completed the largest piece of um, outdoor art of your entire career. Um, mm -hmm. what, what the dimensions were, it was at your alma mater, Madison Park High School, and the dimensions were 37 feet high, 
and a hundred is thirty six feet high, one hundred and seven feet wide. Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah. And it was Breathe Life Two, um, and mm -hmm. so um, for those of you who have not followed him, um, you should get out. There's um, a walking map that we'll send a link to at some point during this evening um, that features a lot of his work, but also um, other people <clears throat> in the city. And Rob is the one that actually curated that list of stops. So um, really beautiful, really makes our city gorgeous um, and really gives us a chance to um, tell our own stories, our stories of, of us, where we come from, the neighborhoods we come from, the families that we grow up with. Um, and we get a chance to make our own city beautiful. So I, I just think that's an important moment to recognize. Um, we've also been doing a lot of interviews lately. And in one of your interviews, I know you started to talk about how you were learning how to write. And so I want you to share a little bit about that. Cause the one thing that stood out to me was you, I can't exactly remember what you said, but you talked about how it empowered you. Like when you were finally able to create your own graffiti style, you, you felt like you really owned a new space. So, so say more about that. I'll say more about that. And thank you, Makiba, for such an awesome intro. Um, hello to everybody out here tuning in. To talk about finding my voice through graffiti, it was one of those things where um, you just can't open up a book and instantly become great. There's no how to. There isn't a, a can of fresh that you can just spray on the wall and immediately what you think should come out will come out. This is something that you'd have to take some time to understand that it is an it is an articulation of the alphabet, just like how you know the the Egyptians wrote the hieroglyphics and things of that nature. Being a very very strong advocate in hip hop culture, I knew that if I were to master this discipline, that I would have to take the time to hone the skill. And my beginnings came from just being around, you know, young young fellas that we were all like turned on by it. But I had a book by the name of Aerosol Art, which was my my blueprint, my Bible. Um, it was from copying, you know, pages out of that book and just kind of introducing myself on like letter style and techniques and just anatomy of putting together the names. Um, I've evolved from just doing my name into elevating on the artist name that chose me, which is pro-black. And it's kind of wild that if you look in pro-black, Rob is in it. But as you see Rob in that title, I felt like the more and the more I gotten older and the more I started to understand the context of why or how it chose me, that I was representing everybody. And it wasn't just my name anymore, it was everybody's name. So that's when I felt a lot more obligated to the point that if I was getting invited on to be a part of big productions, which are like large scale murals from other writers, or we were doing things on a Sunday, like some fellas to go play ball, we went and go paint some walls, <laughs> you know? And I was adamant about painting my entire name because it was a statement, you know what I mean? It is a statement. And I didn't want anybody like getting it confused because when I was shortening it to get like, you know, a stronger sense of can composition and can control, um, people were calling me everything except the name. They were like, does, it, does that say plaque? Or is that PB, P, P peanut butter? I was like, nah, dude. All right, so you, 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 you <laughs> jumped ahead. I had my favorite question, which was gonna be, I want you to talk about pro and I want you to talk oh, about black. black. And I want you to talk about the fact that you say that those, those don't belong to you, that that does not, that's not yours. It's not mine, it's ours. Um, it's very simple. You understand the English language. Pro is for black is our people. All right. I represent a large portion of the, the area of Boston I grew up in, which is predominantly black, Latino, poor whites. You know what I mean? And we've all grown up in these situations where we benefit from programming and things that put us together. But what we did outside, which we were fighting so hard to do, is where everybody's skill set or talent showcased in so many platforms and ways. And the advocacy for that, whether you were a very strong in sports, you could have been very strong in speaking for the people. So you're like an MC. You might have been a community organizer, just so that you and your friends have like places to go based off of activating the community. 
like they weren't like our folks wasn't taking us to amusement parks we were just always into like you know situations that would raise that level of awareness so we go to the boys and girl clubs the rec rooms and in those spaces and spots is where we would all activate each other's imaginations skill sets and so forth so to have this love for doing graffiti and feeling like you know what i got this name that sticks out to people i've had artists even ask me like are you serious like is, is that what you really write and i'm like yo come on i would take offense to it but I didn't know how uncommon it was for people to think that like you would choose a name that's so, it's so like, um, it, 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 can, it can spark some level of um, interest or, you know, misconception. And I was all about standing up for it. So that's what I, that's when I came to like, to the point where I was like, I gotta, I gotta stay firm on this. <laughs> so I've had a chance to watch you at work um, and, I've had a chance to see how many people support you, how many people come out to celebrate you when you're at a wall. And frankly, I have to say that I was amazed at how generous you were, both with mm. your um, willingness to stop your work and have a conversation or to um, introduce someone to me and make sure that I knew that they were an upcoming artist. Um, and a lot of that, you know, the conversations that I heard were about taking care of your neighborhood, taking care of your community, taking care of yourself and, um, and celebrating those things. It's just finding a place where you can, find, you can represent what's inside of you. And if, you're, if your um, methodology is on a wall, that's cool. If it's on a piece of paper, that's cool too. If it's through a song, that's great. I want you to talk about the first time that you saw somebody find themselves in your work. Mm. But, like, I know the last time you saw that, so we can work backwards, but I bet there was a first time. Wow, there's 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 a there's a lot of stories, a lot. Um, if there was a first time that I found out that the best education is through advocation, um, it would have I would have to say the the strongest that that's like coming up in my mind is when I did the, the third Breathe Life with the brother and sister together. And there was a gentleman who came up and I would see him every day, you know, going past here and there. And, um, you know, one day I was getting interviewed, but he came up and he was like, yo, brother, you know, I love you, man. And I was like, word, I got love for you too. Like, that's cool, that's cool. He was like, you understand why? And I was like, nah, I don't, I don't like, like tell me, enlighten me, right? And he had said that his brother had went missing a few years ago and they still put out the, you know, the search for him and such. And he was like, today I found him. And he pointed to the wall. And when he said that, it was the most like powerful way I've heard somebody said that they seen not only a relative of theirs in the work, but they see relevance. It was like looking in a mirror and it could see things that reminded them of something that could be like um, so displaced and, and, and full of other feelings that like he put the positive on it and was like, yo, I don't have to look for him no more. He's right here. And so for him to find his brother in my work and to see himself looking at it because he lives around the, the, the area, man, that spoke volumes and, and it resonated me in a way that I was like, okay, I gotta keep this going. This is this is this is this is this is what it's about. And you so, just did it again. You just you just created this like thirty-seven foot mm -hmm. gorgeous little brown girl who's overlooking half of the city. And mm -hmm. you saw how many little girls come up and like just look up in the sky, including Bobby, your daughter, right? <laughs> exactly. My my daughter will come there every day and tell me, Daddy, ooh, that's me. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. I created this illustration before you even came to the planet, but like, I'll roll with that. You know what I mean? Um, there was a lot of young girls that were coming up there doing the little TikTok videos. Um, I was tagged in so many posts where like the little girls' reactions to, to seeing a girl that looks like them, that they resonate with, larger than life and not scared. You get what I'm saying? Like she's colossal, yeah. 37 yeah. feet. 
is a is a is a is a is a hit. But at 36 feet, she peaks, and everything's larger than life. And there's nothing but smiles, glazed eyes, and in such a time where we're like looking down and just kind of, you know, challenged with this whole backdrop of COVID and uncertainty. I wanted people to look up and feel like, you know, they're at where the little girl is at on the mural. Just just being able to look forward and whether you're as close as we we were to it in the whole development of it, or you're as far as away as a child mm. from children's hospital in a recovery mm. room and you can look out the window and see, boom, right there on the campus. There's a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a message that I left there for them to breathe life. Right. Mm -hmm. Christine, will you give us a time check in the chat when we need to um, just pay attention because I've lost track. Um, Rob, you also um, were working on this last project um, when George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. And um, for people of color, for those of us who are Black in the city, um, that, was a, that was two weeks that I actually still don't think I can really articulate what I went through as the mother of a, a brown um, young man, as a black woman in the city, as um, somebody who wants to make sure that all of the children in the city feel full agency to just be wherever they wanna be and be safe in doing that. Um, and I'm curious if you've had a chance to process a little bit more, what, like, what stands out to you from that, those, those weeks where you watch some of the protests go by even? Right. And, that, and that's what stood out the most, um, to be live and direct in the, in, the, in, the, in the midst of a lot of protests going on day in, day out. Um, it, it, it allowed me to witness from a, from a viewing standpoint that this, this is the generation where no one's letting up off of what's, what's wrong. You know, um, I hear everybody, I see everyone, and to be live and direct and, and, it, and it happening, just know that the, um, the uncertainty is, is about to get very clear. It's just the beginning. Um, for half of the leaders that we've looked up to, you gotta remember how old they were when they were highly active. And to see as many young people active in this city, to stand up for what's right, to be heard, to, to, to change what's been, you know, kind of a thumb on everybody's head. It's been a very powerful moment to 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 just not have to feel like I need to jump in, mm. but to be like, yo, you know what? I got y'all. But you, you were in, right? Listen. You were in. You were you were working on this piece that is celebrating, right. you know, artists of color, celebrating young people. Mm -hmm. You could see her from the police station. You can see her from the colleges. You can see her from Children's Hospital. So I think I mean you were part of it. Yeah, I mean, but the the the, the cool thing about that is that this is what I always do. You understand? It's just the timing around yeah. everything happening. It's just so, it's just, it's just the universe reacting to what we've always done. There's nothing different about what I've been doing. It's just in different places mm -hmm. where I do it. You understand? So like, I've always been about kind of speaking to things of a different, to balance it. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. It's like, wow, the media, and now social media is pounding on these visuals and, 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 and charging everybody a certain way. I'm like, okay, take a break, breathe life. Take mm -hmm. a break, look at what we're doing. Take a break, let's be celebrated in our greatness and our excellence. Let's rise above and continue to do that because that's what the work always do. This is nothing new and I have a extreme amount of, of, of crew and friends that we've been doing this for a very long time. So like, if you can hold, you can hear, and you're paying attention now, great. Because now you can look back at what we've been doing. You can go on these mural tours and see that we've been leaving the messages and the work. It's baked in, it's a part of our DNA. So I think it's nothing different. It's just like, you know, for me to say I'm watching it, I really know that I'm a part of it. And they always say, you never know that you're in, you're, you're involved in something because you're always doing, you know? So I, I pay attention to that. The best education is an advocation, you know? Absolutely. Um, I think our, our time is almost up, but I'm gonna ask you to close with 
the one piece of advice that you always give young people consistently? Consistently. Oh man, let me see. Particularly when it's about them yeah, owning when it's about their them. own space and owning own space. Their, their power, right? Like if you Right, can. right, right. So if you can be a young person out here listening to what I'm saying, I need you to take responsibility for your own learning. Never go somewhere and say you didn't learn anything. This is your responsibility. And be mindful of what you think because what you think will become your words. Your words will become your actions. Your actions will define your character. All right. Everybody can just grow on and flow on and breathe life and we'll be good <laughs> to go. <laughs> that, that, Thank those you. are my words and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right. Everybody All right, go vote. Everybody has to vote. Don't Indeed. forget to vote. <laughs> your powers and vote and make sure you do that. Stay strong, y'all. Thank you. Hi, Diana. Hi, Karen. How are you doing? That is great. That's an incredible conversation. Yeah, he's, my he's, mind is humming. Yeah, he's, he's pretty inspirational. I've known him for a few years since I uh, was uh, working with Artists for Humanity, which Rob is one of the co-founders of. Um, and he, uh, he's so humble. It's, um, he didn't share even half of um, how much of a mentor he is to young kids and artists. So, um, and we started with you introducing yourself. Yeah, I'm yeah. um, Diana Weimar, and this is a project that I created and now curate. Um, it's called the Tiny Prince Project. There are over three, 500 pieces created by people from around the world. And Karen, you've made two, and, and listen to Rob talk, it's Heart Mural. It's, about recording history, as our attorney general reminded us to stay in the moment. And um, what you see in this wall are pieces stitched by people and they've donated to the project in protest and supporting each other. And these are all sayings um, largely of Trump, but in January we moved it to transition to a new language. So we've included words from other politicians and inspirational leaders. Um, and just to expand our vocabulary, because as, as Rob was talking about, language use is important. Mm -hmm. And so both to witness, but also to transition into a more positive space. Mm -hmm. So I'm uh, Karen Tab, and um, I am a multidisciplinary artist, a maker of things, um, and a um, social justice warrior. And uh, it's great to be in conversation with you, Diana. Um, so how did you find yourself as an artist in this nexus of activism and art? And what inspired you? <laughs> no, that's a big question. But I think, obviously, when you look at this project, it's clothes and inspiration. And the Vietnam Memorial is as well. And I think right now, whatever you're doing, however you're protesting this presidency, it's hard to be alone and to do it. So we want to make art that other people can see and they can experience. And this project is sort of a call and response because I make a piece, I think, twice a day now. And then people from around the country, wherever, make pieces and send them back. So I'm incredibly inspired by you know, the idea that people will give of their time, that they will sit with this very difficult language. Um, and then that they will donate this project to this sense of community. And that's what we're all thinking about during this convention is how do we re rebuild our community, given where we've come from and where we want to go. And I'm really inspired by the generosity of people, not just telling new stories, but talking about their feelings. Do you remember your first, the first piece you staged? <laughs> it was the I am a very stable genius. A very stable genius. Yeah, but it took me a couple years to figure out uh, know how to become active. Mm -hmm. It's not always easy. So you yeah. have to become an activist. Yes. We were just saying earlier that it took you, you know, it's been a recent practice. And, and so that's, uh, that saying uh, was my invitation to start this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, and I'm curious, what sort of current events inspire you to create work? Are you following the news the way I am? Or what, where, do you, where are you looking for inspiration right now? Um, so, uh, given that I've only been an artist for, I don't know, about six years, um, I draw inspiration from pretty much everything. So, I was born in South Africa, I was raised in Israel, and I've lived here for the last 20 years. So, that's part of my inspiration. Um, I'm a white, privileged Jewish woman, and nowadays that serves as a lot of inspiration for me. Um, I've seen conflict across the world. 
um, that is definitely an inspiration. Um, and I um, have been a nonprofit, uh, you know, I've been a nonprofit work pretty much my entire career. And so that has been an inspiration for me. Um, I think that um, since the elections, both my husband and I have tried to mitigate the amount of uh, news we watch. Uh, we read and we listen to news, but we watch very little also because we just won't let him in our house. Um, so um, I'm just drawing inspiration from everything that's going on around me uh, at the moment. It's interesting because we're both drawing this inspiration from what's happening in the moment. I think I, I've opened the door to Trump into my house. <laughs> <laughs> my family's house is in so many different places. And, and like you, I've moved around a lot. I've thought about place, sense of place, and memory. Mm -hmm. And I think that looking really deeply right now and looking to art to draw us forward mm -hmm. is, is really what we have in common, depending on the different you know, the area in which you find your entry into it. And I think that's with art and activism and politics, just finding that place right. where you can create something right. is, is amazing. And you've done two pieces for this project, so you've let his language in somehow. Yes, but then I'm giving them back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so many people say that to me. Really? But in organizing this event tonight, you found a way to draw artists together. You and I were doing an artist talk for yeah. the show, yeah. and, and instead we've done this amazing fundraiser on this incredible, during this incredible convention. Right. Really. And it's important, I think, to remind ourselves that that's what we're doing right now. Right. Well, I think that artists, as artists, we have, and I feel this very strongly, I, uh, I have one voice. I have one voice and I have one life, and what am I going to do with it? And I feel compelled almost every night, and the older I get, the longer it takes me to fall asleep. <laughs> and I lie awake at night thinking about what am I going to do with what I have? And I have so much. Um, and for me, it's almost like this day call to action um, what is it going to what am i going to do how am i going to change the course of what kind of being and in our you know jewish tradition we have to start the work we don't have to finish it um, and that's how i get through thinking about the magnitude of the work that needs to be done it's just too much for any one of us at any time. I can relate to so many of the things. Yeah. <laughs> there's too much. There's that's too much. The thing right. about engaging in politics right now is, is there's just too much. And I think that's the way that Trump has, has just numbed us and, and disoriented us. Um, I began this project thinking that you could say something as outrageous once a week, and now it's I. Okay. It, you can't even keep up, and so there's this sense of yes, I, and I think it's important to also acknowledge that the work isn't finished. Right. And, and this work is the piece that you can finish, but, but what's behind it, the words, the language, the policies, the politics, mm -hmm. we're just beginning to peel that back. And I think, I hope that this project will be a way to remember. Mm -hmm. Like when you leave a place and you move, you take some part of those yeah. memories with you. Right. So this show in general, if you haven't been to Beacon Gallery, please do come. The show is called Mixed Messages, and it is about um, uh, issues that relate to women's uh, assault, uh, femicide, uh, and the mixed messages that our society cultivates. And, um, and so this, this wall alone is about, you've picked only issues that relate to things you said about women. Yeah. So tell us maybe about one piece or one story that oh, has come yeah. with one of Rough the pieces. So well. it, it, there have been so many pieces. Yeah, this is only the second show that I curated. It, it's always been kind of a, a, a hodgepodge, all the pieces mixed together. The first show I curated was to do address climate change, and now the second is the language coming out of this presidency mm -hmm. and the way in which it's been weaponized to, to attack women. Um, you know, there, there's an incredible wall here, but this piece up here, um, Send Her Back, was done by a um, woman of color who had immigrated to this country. And when she heard that, she was actually uh, is, is a doctor in training, and she said that she heard that, Send Her Back, and even though she had been in this country and has trained in this country and been supported by Americans, that those three words just instilled in her a sense of fear. Mm -hmm. So she 
went to a thrift store, she got a hanky, she snitched the piece and sent a picture to, of it to me in her scrubs in the car and, and said, you know, I want to tell both sides. This language scares me. And Americans, this country, its values, its culture have supported me. Mm -hmm. And every single one of these pieces has some sort of story like that. So it's really important to just keep looking at these words and see how they make people feel and, and to acknowledge those right. feelings. Right, yeah. and, and rhetoric, uh, um, language matters. Language matters, language matters a lot. Um, I've been diving very deep lately into issues of uh, racism and um, uh, racial issues that are uh, abundant in our country. And so much of what we, the language that we use, we actually don't even understand how much it reinforces, um, I mean, you put a house for sale on the market and you talk about a master bedroom and there you have it, right? And things that we don't even think about, but I think that uh, as we become more sensitized to issues of language and how the use of it plays into stereotypes, um, radical thoughts, uh, racism, of course, gender issues, I, I think we should remember how much. It's a constant uncovering. And, and what is dangerous about Trump is when he says, you know, suburban housewives of America. I, I mean, this language, it's we are, it's really pricking us. That's why it's called tiny Purse. It's really pricking us. And I hope it's pricking us awake. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can withstand the pain of that self-analysis and, and looking very deeply. Because you're right, language is just an entry point into much, much deeper things that are being mm -hmm. unveiled. And, and that's what this presidency has, has done, um, has left us very raw. So you talk about tiny pricks, and I think everybody thinks it's a different kind of tiny pricks. <laughs> they do, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, I want to be very clear that it's not that kind at all. It, it was, you know, for me, it was this act of, of you know, stitching and making these tiny marks again and again and again, the words like tiny marks building up, but also really fundamentally to prick your conscience mm -hmm. and what wakes us up mm -hmm. and, and how do we develop a conscience mm -hmm. and, and how do we reflect on what we say and what we do. Um, it, it's extremely important now to analyze how we respond to things as you're, you know, you just reveal. Yeah. Master bedroom, I hadn't, yeah, there are, there are a lot of things that we don't think about yeah. that we uh, use all the time. Um, that we should be coming up, uh, be more and more sensitive to. Um, um, so one of the things that Rob was talking about in his words, the best education is through advocation. Um, so talk a little bit about advocacy as it relates to this project um, and to your work in general. Yeah, the, the word that comes to mind for me is, of those two words, is, is education. And, and I feel like I'm an artist being educated. Um, and I'm trying to be an advocate for the creative process. But what comes back to me with all of these pieces is the sense of urgency and advocacy that mm -hmm. people feel for themselves. So I'm really um, now at this point curating something that is really about creating a space for people to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. And especially during the pandemic, when no one could go outside and, and people were baking and gardening and, and stitching. Yeah. And so my sense of advocacy is, is, is developing. Really, I've, it's been an education for me. I, I mm -hmm. feel like I now can tell what quotes will come back to me in stitch forms, mm -hmm. but every single person stitches them differently. Mm -hmm. And every single person through this project is becoming an advocate for themselves. And I think social media is a very big part of that. And, and this project would not exist without Instagram, especially during the pandemic. Um, the gallery has been extremely generous, making this possible for you and I to sit six feet apart to talk to each other. This is this is not something we can do very easily anymore, and we're finding new ways to become advocates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what do you find when you're creating your work? Are you thinking about the community in which you're going to share it and show it, or the community that you're representing, or the issues that you're addressing? What is your relationship to a larger um, community? So, first of all, I'm deeply rooted in the communities that I live in. That has always been, and I think about uh, the words of Michelle Obama last night, um, about being, what it means to be a community member. It's not only about taking 
it is in my mind that human. Um, so um, I think because my work is so much about my identity um, as a woman, as a white woman, as a Jewish woman, as a, being labeled a flaming lefty, which I own proudly, <laughs> um, and being a, a member of the human kind, um, being of different countries, speaking multiple languages. So I think that the work that I make is about me, but resonates with the people um, around me. Most people are from more than one country, and if not in this generation, then in the generation before. Um, many people have lived in, in uh, countries that are uh, of conflict and, uh, and understand what it means to have a dual identity or um, to um, watch and know people who have died in wars. Um, so I think that my story resonates with a lot of people and I want to be able to use my voice to tell the story. Um, and, and I joke that I made a bed uh, out of chicken wire um, for a show that was here not long ago and I was all cut up by it. But as I was making this bed out of chicken wire, there were children in cages behind chicken wire on the southern border. So it's not my story, it's our story, it's our collective story. And, and I feel privileged to be able to tell it and share it with other people. Yeah, yeah I felt the same way looking at, at your work even before I met you. It reminded me of these stories and, and you're right. I think being invested in being part of a community is one of the most important things right now. And, and as you said, that I instantly thought, well, art is a community. Absolutely. This is a community. Absolutely. The people who follow this project and participated in it, um, I hope and I think have a relationship with each other. Are we getting the signal on time? Are we getting the signal that your time is on the We're not too long, but I, I think we can talk about it. But, but it is a community from which I feel like you can leave and you can come back. Yeah. And that's one of the ways we know it's a community. Mm -hmm. And so during this year, this presidency with so many challenges and so many ways in which we're separated, mm -hmm. I think what we've seen and talked about tonight are these ways in which people have, have found a way to share their yeah. stories. Still. So I have one more question yeah. for you, which is on November 3rd, when he is voted out, yes. what is going <laughs> to what is going to happen to the Tiny Prince project? So because it's capturing the language, she will still be in office. Um, and I just said, I, until January. So I said the project would end and he's out of office before the Mueller report came out, but I thought he certainly would serve the full term. Right. Um, the answer is I don't know, because mm -hmm. this is a project that follows what's happening politically. And you and I don't have any, we know he will lose, but we don't know how. Or if he'll leave office. Or he'll leave office. So, so how does that story, you know, other people, if you're attorney general, you file a lawsuit. What, what, what are we going to do? We're going to respond. And that will shape the way this ends. Right now, I'm just keeping it in place and holding it to see how many pieces we can get and how many voices will come forward. How much of a record are we going to create um, through this medium? Uh, and then it's something about the good vacation. <laughs> <laughs> to rejuvenate. Maybe we'll go somewhere. No, I guess we can't go anywhere. So I'll stay home. <laughs> well, how about we roll this out on the ball on the day of that, Biden's inauguration? That would be amazing. That would be amazing. If every person could be there, wouldn't there be? Or, <laughs> that would be or people may, yeah, that many, would be amazing. Um, but it's been a privilege to do this project. And I think um, I, I'm incredibly grateful to you for you know participating twice and and joining this project and working with this language that you know you no doubt found difficult to work with but made easy work. Thank so, you yeah. and thank you. Thank you for giving voice to uh, many artists and to many women artists. I know that some uh, have told you stories of sexual assault and um, yeah, there are that I, I found very powerful. So yeah, yeah, there are a lot of stories. Yeah, I just stepped aside and went on the story. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Good evening. Uh, I am thrilled to be with you all. Um, it's Kathy Gasparine. Uh, many of you uh, know me from previous cycles where I had the pleasure of working um, with, with many of you on the Hillary uh, and Obama campaigns. Um, thank you, thank you for, for being here this evening. Uh, 
Uh, I was asked by the host committee to give closing remarks, which is so flattering. And I channeled my inner Carol Fulp um, with some, some, some fabulous jewelry that I know she would approve. Thank um, everyone for their help this evening uh, to make this such a, a great success. Um, first, uh, Beacon Galleries um, and Christine O'Donnell, uh, you guys were amazing with, uh, with your creativity and putting uh, this together logistically. Um, Nate Burks, uh, who volunteered to help with, with some of our, uh, our technical support. Um, we're going to have the recording actually available on their website for anyone who wants to, uh, to, to, to view it, who wasn't able to be a part of our community and conversation this evening. Um, thank you to our surrogates who lent their voices um, and their insights to this evening. Um, we are so fortunate to have in the Commonwealth, uh, Maura Healy, um, but also Makiba, Rob, Diana, Karen, your work inspires us all and your thoughtfulness um, is just incredible. And thank you uh, for, for allowing us this outlet this evening. Um, and the co-chairs that helped make this event uh, the, the success that it is, uh, I feel like it was about a month ago when um, we started this conversation and um, the village um, uh, came together and we more than shattered our goal. Um, so thank you to Ruth, uh, Representative Ruth Balzer, to Carol, to Ann Ellen Hornage and Ned Murphy, to Jill Goldenberg, Donald, Diana Waymer, and, uh, and the glue that really got this going and are, are truly just a, a force of nature. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. And um, so I wanted to announce, um, if I may, we have to raise $75,000 this evening for the Biden campaign, um, uh, which is amazing. And, and entirely uh, contributions, uh, vast majority were um, low dollar, new to the campaign, value add. Um, so I'm gonna give you all three calls to action for this evening um, to take with you. Um, first is you can give more. <laughs> if anyone says they're maxed out, that's not true. Uh, but the thing is, this isn't just about the money, as we all know, um, this is about finding a way to engage people that ensures that they're going to then give their vote and then if we get a dollar from someone, let alone uh, if their capacity allows them to give more, we know in 2016 at times. Um, so the ground in the ground um, for Joe Biden and for Democrat down the ballot. We cannot stop. The finance committee uh, will be sending around that information. Join the National Finance Committee. Um, it, take all of your energy and 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 pour it into this campaign. The second thing you can do is volunteer your time. Um, we've actually adopted uh, in Massachusetts four states. So you can either volunteer via our state where you kind of do it more in a, a choose your own adventure. Um, you can pick your states where you'd like to engage. Um, all of this is obviously done from the comforts of your own home. So uh, this is no excuse for, our, for any of us to, to find um, a small window of time to carve out. Um, and of course, um, this is a unique uh, election where obviously the right to vote and access to the ballot is really under um, attack. So there's, so we're not necessarily relying on, you know, setting the polls this evening. So please, please, it's also a, a, in a way to engage with voter protection efforts through the Biden campaign. And um, tonight they're going to have 17 of the uh, rising stars of the Democratic Party, in, including um, Dr. Biden. So uh, please, uh, I, hope you, I hope you all can hear me and uh, thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for the host committee. Thank you all for coming this evening. And um, it was a pleasure to see all of you. Thank you, Kathy, for your words. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful evening and that concludes the end of the program. So um, again, thank you for your participation. Have a nice night. <laughs>